Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and, and thank you very much for having me. Uh, I feel that behind this uh, podium, I must be the shortest speaker you've had. Uh, but it's very, very good to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, my fourth book uh, called Connect, uh, which, uh, which I believe you're going to get a copy of afterwards, so you can either not listen to this or listen to it and then pretend you've read the book. Uh, I, I think when it uh, came out, uh, as things happen, of course, people wanted to summarize what the book was about uh, and uh, get it down to a couple of very quick uh, phrases. And they were the following. There are only two points. First is Brown calls for the death of corporate social responsibility. And secondly, Brown calls for the death of corporate public relations. The second may be more important to you here than the first. Uh, but actually, my remarks this morning hopefully will flesh out those two points into something with a little bit more uh, rationale. So I'm going to make four points, if I can, this morning, and just illustrate them very quickly with a few examples. I think the first is, is obvious that business has had a checkered past when it comes to engaging with society and its relationship with society. You only have to listen... Uh, to the Today programme yesterday and today uh, to see one of those debates happening today. But business is clearly the engine of human progress. I firmly believe it, and in my experience, I've seen that happen everywhere in the world. But it's struggled throughout its history to build and maintain a good relationship with society, evidenced, I think, if you go back and read Shakespeare and The Merchant of Venice to this morning and yesterday listening uh, to the debate about Google's tax affairs. So all of these things do create uh, cycles of suspicion. And bus some business leaders, and many I've spoken to, indeed writing the book, we spoke to several hundred of them in uh, very detailed interviews. Uh, when they really talk to you, they say, actually, there's nothing we can do about this. They're all cycles. Sometimes we're in the dock, sometimes we're not. Just let it play out. That, I think, is very dangerous indeed, because history doesn't actually show that that's the case. There are secular changes in attitudes towards business uh, that can be hugely damaging for companies uh, and the wider society. And in spite of our last presenter, uh, I want to use uh, the Volkswagen example. Interestingly, uh, before we, as we were writing this book, I wrote it with a couple of people from McKinsey, we did a lot of analysis about what value is at risk inside a company if they damage their reputation. The range is very wide, but the average is 30%. So 30% is a good number. And when Volkswagen were found out about pollution control, their stock price did actually drop, I believe, by 30% on that day. It was a, a nice and surprising result because it happened two weeks after the book was published, so people thought that the book was extraordinarily good at forecasting the future. Uh, that is not the case, but it does make the point that this is about value at risk. For society, it's about uh, the value at risk for society too. I think it's no exaggeration to say that uh, during the global financial crisis, the debate on the question of banks and whether they should exist, even in remarkable circles around the world, people were beginning to wonder whether banks in the form that we knew them should actually exist. And that's a very dangerous debate, uh, one which is not wholly resolved everywhere. A debate which, if you go back in history to 100 years before the Common Era, 100 years BC, you see the same debate in China, which was set up between the two opposing sides uh, about uh, what merchants did with iron and salt. Uh, and both sides tried to debate who was right, who was wrong, the people or the merchants. Uh, and actually, the surprising thing we found out by looking at Joe Needham's, Joseph Needham's comments in the corners of this important book was that actually everyone hated business and they were simply having an artificial debate to figure out where they could put business in the rank order of people. They naturally classified merchants who dressed well, uh, raped and pillaged the uh, countryside uh, as the bottom of the pile. They were regarded as the lowest st strand of society, 
uh, only the lower, the lower, lower than them were the sons of merchants who got right to the bottom. Uh, the second point I want to make is that uh, the challenge for companies today uh, seeking to gain society's trust or a bond with society is harder than ever before. And I think when I started in business, which seemed uh, like a different, a totally different historic era, um, there was actually a great respect for authority, even when it was abused. People wouldn't dream of asking very important people to justify themselves. They would just say, tell us more, great leader. Uh, and that's all they did. There was no test. And it could take years before corporate misdemeanors came out in public. Today, of course, transparency is no longer optional. Everyone is connected. The powerful tools of communication, investigation, and debate are there everywhere. Uh, and every movement and every statement is more easily scrutinized. I remember for my company, I'd, I'd left the company, but the great uh, spill in the Gulf of Mexico, I was in the States, checking into a hotel. You could see the oil pouring into the Gulf of Mexico uh, every second, every day, and there was a big debate. Was it a lot of oil? Was it a little oil? Who knows? And in this environment, uh, I think uh, a lot of people thought perhaps more PR was needed than less. Tony Hayward, my successor, uh, after the Macondo incident, actually, he didn't handle a lot of it well. He would say that. Uh, I would say that too. Uh, but uh, afterwards, he said, you know, if I had done a degree at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art rather than a degree in geology, I may have done better. But companies, I think, don't, should not seek uh, to manage their reputation. Reputation is a reservoir of goodwill that has to be built up over time and then drawn, uh, drawn out, drawn on uh, over a crisis. And you can see that by looking at what J&J &J did with Tylenol uh, right through to the present day. And I think the quote I like most of all uh, is Socrates, who said, the way to gain a good reputation is to endeavor to be what you desire to appear. Uh, so in this new environment, I think, of greater scrutiny, companies uh, obviously are found out if they fail to be authentic in what they say and what they do. So gaining reputation is an outcome of activity. And that brings me to my third point. So it seems to me that uh, businesses only really do gain uh, trust when they try and integrate, when they actually don't try, they, they do integrate the concerns of society into everything that they do and into the relevant parts of what they do. Corporate social responsibility, and I was a great advocate for it about two decades ago, has been the primary way in which businesses have, have sought to build that relationship with society. But it's really failed. Uh, corporate social responsibility is usually detached from a company's core purpose. It is not recognized by the people doing the real business. It is often a plaything. It is often a headquarters activity. It is not actually attached to what a company is really doing. And actually, when we asked uh, all these CEOs, uh, and we did a very big survey on this, we asked about 5,000 of them, what, uh, what do they think? Uh, less than 30% said that they actually integrated the impact of external stakeholders uh, into the business that they did. So less than 30%. And what's more, only 20% said that they had people on their, in their teams who had the skills to do this. So 30% said, less than 30% said they did it, and then of the 30%, only 20% said they actually had people who could really do it well. Not a very big number. And I think significantly, you know, CSR has, has become a very dangerous crutch. And I think uh, Howard Davis, who now is the chairman of uh, RBS, when, when, when I talked to him, uh, he, I think he put it well. He said, look, it's simply like this. In my experience at boards, uh, companies look at CSR for half an hour on a Friday afternoon. 
So even at its best, I think CSR prevents, fails to prevent corporate misbehavior and certainly doesn't insulate a company from serious reputational damage. Uh, the Volkswagen point has been made already. Uh, Lehman Brothers is another. Uh, and the third, of course, is Enron. Uh, all these companies, in particular Enron, uh, were, won so many awards in this area, it is uh, 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 unbelievable. They, they came top of polls many, many years for doing corporate social responsibility really well. I'm always reminded of this, a man who uh, occupies an office next door to me he used to, long, one time, a long time ago, uh, work for uh, Enron and has in his office only one thing uh, framed on the wall, and it is an unbroken, unread copy of uh, Enron's uh, ethical principles, framed in a very large frame. Uh, I think it reminds you. Uh, so it seems to me that all of this leads to what, what you do with this. You can't just say all these things are bad. Is there something that can be done? There are plenty of bits of advice, and, and my book does not contain a, a recipe or formula, because I don't believe in those things. I think everything is so situation dependent. But it opens up a debate, about a debate about what to do. At its core, it is about radical engagement, which in my experience is something which does make the biggest difference. Uh, and my definition of that is engagement uh, on the basis uh, and desires of what someone else wants to do, not what you want to do. And corporations so often look at people and say, this is what we want you to do. I think you need to turn it around and say, what would you like us to do? Uh, and then you begin to get uh, a radical engagement. Uh, I think that requires you to lean into problems. Uh, in the oil and gas business, one of the biggest is the question of climate change. Uh, I remember taking, uh, and it takes a risk, in, in 97, uh, I broke with the industry by actually leaning into that problem, simply saying, yes, we are part of the problem, but we want to be part of the solution. It's tough to do that, and uh, of course the industry itself said, this is not a good idea, we don't want to admit that, uh, we'd like to do something else, and indeed, because the solutions are so long-winded, Plenty of NGOs said to me, you're simply doing greenwash. Actually, we weren't. We were trying to lean into a problem, get a dialogue going on someone else's terms. Similarly, I remember uh, dealing with a very vexed question of, build, of uh, developing a gas field in a, in a place called Papua. It's a very uh, isolated part of Indonesia, it used to be called Irian Jaya, uh, a place which... Uh, has a, very, has a very bad human rights uh, track record, not least probably inspired by uh, the army who is there, who was there policing the place, uh, and uh, they uh, were both the, the solution to HR, uh, human rights problems, but also the cause, uh, because if they stayed there, they got paid more by being in Papua rather than being in Indonesia itself. So they perpetuated the problem. Well, we had a gas field there which uh, un inconveniently uh, was located under a couple of villages. Uh, the villages themselves were at war uh, and they were very difficult, uh, uh, everyone thought, uh, and the proposal was made to me that what we really had to do was to move the villages so we could conveniently uh, develop the gas field. This was not a good idea. Uh, and uh, so we concluded that we had to do something entirely different both technologically, but more importantly, by the time we got round to that, no one trusted anybody. They didn't trust the army, they didn't trust us, they didn't trust anybody. And we couldn't communicate. So the only, we, we, we found something very simple to do, which was find a very trusted person, get him to, right, it was him in this case, run a commission, uh, four people uh, from the UN, from local, uh, really local respected people, and to supervise what the company was doing. The twist in the tail, of course, uh, was to make sure that he reported to everybody simultaneously. No preview with the company, no stitch up before the report was put out. And over time, people understood that they could trust because we were prepared to engage on the basis of what they wanted, 
not on the basis of what we wanted. And I suppose if there were one thing I would uh, draw this together with my earlier book, uh, The Glass Closet, about being gay in business, I'd say there's no universal, in my view, there's no universal uh, theory of leadership and leadership at all. But all theories of leadership and all practices of leadership, I think, have just one thing, and it is related to engagement. And it is an uncompromising commitment to inclusion, a really uncompromising commitment to inclusion, which is about the people in a firm, and it's about the people outside the firm. Because if you include them, you actually get alignment, and therefore you get engagement. And every time anyone looks at this, companies that actually engage make more money than those who don't. Uh, and whether it's over, it, it takes a bit of a while to see that, but it's all about inclusion. It is, I think, about making sure there are no barriers, uh, that you don't, that there are no barriers, and that you treat everyone in the way they expect to be treated. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all I want to say by way of remarks. Can we do some Q and A? Uh, if there, we have we have mics in the room. If anybody would like to ask a question, so yes, Hugh. Thank you so much. Sorry, Hugh from RPM. Uh, your comment about RADA, uh, should RADA for as part of a CEO's future training, should that potentially be an opportunity to over and above their degree, which may be in their field of expertise? I, I, it's obviously a skill, but I think a skill which needs to be used in its place. I, I remember when I was, uh, I, I think the danger with uh, corporate communication, I see this the whole time, I still do, uh, is that it's, most of it's really quite incredible. Uh, it, and I mean that quite literally, uh, in that it, it, it tends to do things which are, are dangerous. When I was working for the Prime Minister, I remember saying, I was asked by the civil service the whole time, what's wrong? And I would say the problem is uh, that you take a failure and by the addition of words, try and make it a success. Nobody really believes that except you. And it goes on and on again. And, and you, but you've got to take a risk to say, we made a mistake, this is what we're going to do, we're going to learn from it. That's probably great RADA, uh, but you have to do it that way. Otherwise, I think people uh, begin to just uh, not believe a thing. Uh, civil service, everybody says, it's very dangerous. We get, our head gets chopped off if we admit a mistake. But actually, that doesn't actually happen. Very often, you so surprise the people that you're talking to that they don't know what to do next. If you say, well, actually, we made a mistake, and, and here's what we're doing to make it better, normally there's silence, uh, whereas if, because there's nothing to reveal. So unless I, well, one more, one more, Rufus, and then, and then I'm going to call, call it to order because we need Andy to close. So thank you so much. I just wanted to ask how optimistic you are that business will take these issues too hard at the center and rebuild their reputation and um, be more trusted by the public at large? Well, uh, I think if you can score, uh, you know, people often ask you on a scale of one to 10, where do you think the score should be? I think if you get to six, it would be fantastic, well above the average. But I do think people need to reflect on, you know, what are the implications of their acts? I come back to this question of taxes, the debate and Google. Um, you know, this is not going well. And uh, so the more times that things don't go well, uh, the worse it becomes. But I, I do think there are plenty of companies that are beginning to think very differently uh, about how to engage and, and being very realistic about uh, the impact they can have by doing things, you know, partly in a, in a more authentic way, obviously, uh, but in a more direct way on other people's agendas. I think that it's happening, for sure. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Lord Brown.